Life, like the conversation, keeps changing. Get the first ever needs matched life insurance that changes as your life changes. Welcome to the Nanical Show with Brian Chalk in lockdown, but in lockdown for the very last time. We're being released as of next week. We are back in studio for the regular hour-long show, back on Supersport proper, and no longer filming in my garden cottage. So really looking forward to that. But it has been a lot of fun. We've had some terrific guests over the last 10 weeks in this lockdown session. Everybody uh, from Shane Warne to Kelly Slater to Luis Figo to Rud Hullet, Ernie Els, Kevin Peterson, Mike Rutherford. It's been a wonderful, wonderful collection of people. And we also had Ed Moses, of course, last week, which is a nice lead-in to our very first guest for this week. And I thought it was appropriate as we wrap up uh, to go to the guy who, probably along with Sia Khaleesi, would be South Africa's very, very favourite athlete in that most people like him. I am the exception, though. I do not like him. We have a feud running after a race that we had, and we're going to have to settle this now once and for all. Uh, but let's say a very good evening to Wade Van Eekirk. Good day, Dan. Thanks for having me. How's your hamstring? Yeah, so I was going to ask you about that because there's a, there's a bit of karma here, Wade Vanika. I remember watching the footage of that ill-fated uh, touch rugby game of yours when you got injured. And, and I will be honest, I was very, very sad to see it. But there was yeah. some karma, Wade, because when we raced and you just beat me and I tore my hamstring, my lasting image is of you standing over me laughing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's... Uh, it's been a it's been quite a journey uh, since that day, but I believe we're stronger now. My hamstring is fully recovered, thankfully. My physique not quite as important as yours, though. Wade has this extra time in lockdown, this extra time off, been something of a bonus in terms of completing your recovery. Well, it's it's I see it as a massive blessing still for me to uh, be able and continue uh, working and, and investing in in my health and, and my body. I think this time away from the track is, is really just uh, sparking or building up a massive hunger and a massive desire to get back to the, to the track and, and get back dominating. I think uh, I miss the sports. I miss uh, pushing my body to the limits again and I'm looking forward to get back on the track. In terms of the added break, especially with the Olympics now moved out to 2021, has that been a little bit of a bonus for you in terms of your comeback and your return to running? Yeah, I guess any, any time uh, could be seen as a bonus, but I mean, you can look at it either way. Um, we use, I believe that myself personally, I use competing against uh, the best in the world to, to improve myself, to better myself. And obviously, if being away from that for the last two years now, you long that uh, it's a different spark, it's a different type of growth, and and that's the growth that I I seek right now is just to compete against the best in the world, so that I know where I can sharpen up, and I know where I need to work and where I need to uh, improve, and um, at the same time, I mean, I see where where I can I can better myself, so that. When I get to the track, it's 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 about consecutive competitions and just uh, being in the sports for the next what eight to ten years. Normally, at this time of the year, you'd be somewhere exotic around the world, running at high speed or training or or being in somewhere very different. Instead, stuck at home for a very long period of time. Uh, we spoke to Akani Sambine a few weeks back. He was muttering about having to fight off visits to the fridge and getting bored of his phone. Uh, what's this lockdown period been like for you and what have you been doing to keep yourself busy? Well, I guess, um, yeah, like um, I think for the likes of Akani and, and the guys that's been competing for the last few years now, uh, lockdown is definitely tough. But I went through that tough time three years ago after my after my injury where I've basically been living in somewhat of a, a lockdown or a hibernation 
So, um, but the time lockdown was 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 on on us. Uh, I've already had that mentality. It was just to switch back onto it again and and get back grinding again and get back working. Uh, luckily, I've got a, a great facilities at home and I've got a nice gym set up for myself where I can keep myself busy and keep myself going. Since we last had you on the Danical Show, probably the biggest change in your personal life has been Wade Vanikirk, the married man. You've had a pretty good chance to test that marriage over the last <laughs> while. Uh, is, it, uh, is it still laughter and smiles at home? Yeah, I, I mean, it's always a blessing having uh, my wife around me and uh, obviously the contributions that she has in my life and how she makes my life easier is always a, a massive blessing and so on. So I keep it short and sweet. Uh, it's always the wisest way, but um, it's 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 a blessing. I would lie. It's, it's amazing being married and and also my partner. I feel very privileged to to be able to share this life with her. You have two absolute true loves. One is Mrs. Vanie Kirk, and the other is that football team, the shirt of which adorns the wall behind you. <laughs> the Premier League is returning shortly. How excited are you about the season restarting? Uh, and do you think Liverpool have still got this in the bag? I'm very excited. I'm really looking forward. Uh, but at the same time, obviously, you want the guys to stay healthy and and and. I guess somewhat avoid getting the virus and, and spreading it. So at the same time, as a fan, you don't want to be too selfish because you really miss the sports and you really want to watch football again. But at the same time, there's so much people's lives and health at risk. But I'm looking forward to pick up that trophy or to watch the team pick up the trophy. And uh who knows, maybe this year I can go and, and visit the team and pick it up myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you'd be a very, very welcome visitor to Anfield as one of the, the team's better known fans. Just before we let you go, have there been any conversations, any discussions over the course of lockdown with your cousin Cheslin Colby as to whether your world record and gold medal or his try in the World Cup final was the greatest South African sports moment? I don't mind sharing. I won't lie. Um, they, <laughs> especially in a moment like this, I mean, um, it's uh, it's still fresh in all of our minds and all of our hearts. And um, let's be honest, that step was 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 world class, and that final try was uh, out of this world. And I mean, uh, it's it's his moment, it's his time, and I'm just proud to be associated with him. Oh, well, I know it works both ways for him and with you as well. Famous cousins, great South African athletes, and both good friends of the Dan Nichol Show. Wade, uh, good luck with the comeback. We can't wait to see you back on the track and the Thank journey you. that takes you to Tokyo next year. And uh, hopefully another piece of gold to add to the collection. 100%. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, hope you guys are good and healthy and uh, all of the best for when the show starts again. So there we go, Wade Vanikirk. Uh, we're uh, we've got a simmering uh, feud going on, but we'll we'll keep it calm for now. A famous race where he just beat me. Uh, we're looking forward to having him back in the studio once the show gets going again properly, and to watching the fastest man on the planet continue his extraordinary record. Our next guest is a good mate of mine. I've known him for a long time. He's probably the noisiest person I've ever met. When Nick Mallett says that somebody talks too much, you know that they don't have a problem with joining a conversation. We have him in conversation this evening and with great pleasure. Hello, Oscar Michalowski. How's it, Dan? Good to be on to your show. It's very nice. I mean, finally, it's been uh, many years in the making, so we're finally in the same place, nearly in the same place or the same country at the same time. We, we were looking forward to having you on the show in person. That's held off a little, you being down in the Cape and me being up here. And uh, one of the things we were going to do is celebrate this remarkable career of yours that I think often people don't truly appreciate the scope of because what you have done in your kayaking career around the world is quite extraordinary. For people who don't know the Oscar Chalupski story, uh, in under a minute and a half, Oscar, because I know this could take three hours if we get you going, uh, just, uh, just the highlights, the things you've done, the races you've won around the world. Well, I mean, the, the, it all started off when I won the first person in the world in, in surf life to win junior, junior and senior Ironman at age 15 or 14. 
And then I went on to win 12 World Championship, uh, Molokai World Championship, winning one at 20. And then 12 years later, I mean, not 12 years, 30 years later, I won one at 49. And then, and then even my last race I did uh, about a year and a half ago, I won against the top guys in Europe and, and won a race at age 55. So age doesn't seem to be holding me back. There's a few other things holding me back, but not age. That last race, I remember seeing a clip of it. You we were 55, you won it. And the guy who came second was 25. Exactly. His name is Victor Du. He's a very good French guy and he's about six foot five. So in his prime of his career, he was pretty pissed off that I managed to beat him. But uh, these things happen. It takes a bit of skill and, and I still like to win all the time, no matter what I'm doing, as you know. For people who haven't seen the Molokai, well, where does it happen and, and what is the nature of the race? How far are you paddling? What are the challenges? You're paddling 52 kilometers between two islands, the island of Molokai and Oahu, which is where Honolulu is. And there's big waves. Every boat has to, every, every uh, paddler has to have its own escort boat because if you don't hit the other island, you're going to end up in Fiji or you die. So you've got big waves. Uh, it's 52 kilometers. It's really hard. And all the best guys in the world compete. I mean, the year I won my 12th, the guys, he came second, a guy called Clint Robinson from Australia. I beat him by 13 seconds over 52 kilometers. And he had about six or seven uh, Olympic gold medals. So he's doing well. And and I managed to beat a lot of Olympic gold medals. That's my, that's my claim to fame, beating those guys in the waves and in the wind and, and, and using my skill and my knowledge. And obviously, you have to be fit. Believe me, it's not like golf. You, you, this is a, a hard sport. <laughs> it's an incredible challenge that you've taken on every time you've raced one of these and won so many of them. And that has, I, I suspect, set you up mentally for your latest challenge. And this sadly is, is the biggest of all. It doesn't involve waves, it doesn't involve a kayak, but you are in the midst, Oscar, of a really nasty battle with cancer. Yeah, I mean, it was a shock. I mean, I was, again, typical me. I thought, oh, okay, I've got a little bit of a pain in my back, so what can I do? I'll just carry on. And, and it happened in Australia. I was racing in a world championship the race there. And the pain was unbearable. I couldn't sleep at night, but I thought, okay, it's gonna pass eventually. And when I flew back to uh, Portugal, they said, no, 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 they did an MRI and they found a big tumor on my spine, pushing on my spinal cord. And most of the guys said, oh, you've got four to six months, don't worry. I said, okay, that's all right. This is better than one or two days. And then when I came back to South Africa, they found out I had multiple myeloma, which is bone marrow cancer, which is very similar to leukemia and all this. So there's no cure at this stage. So my big goal now, my race for my life is to try and, outlast uh, and last long enough to they till they find a cure because that's the only way out of it so and and i've been i had radiation uh, to kill the tumor in in december it killed my my taste for wine which very upset me a lot but thank goodness that's back and food and then, and then i've been having chemo every single week and then last two weeks ago i had 10 liters of chemo in two days just to make sure that my, my I could, when i harvest my my stem cells or my bone marrow to get it put back in that, that they all did. So I've got a long road ahead. I, I'm gonna be in hospital soon and then I'll probably spend between three and five weeks, depends how everything goes. And then hopefully the stem cell or the bone marrow transplant actually um, takes well. And then, and then I should be clear for a couple of years. And then you, they drew enough uh, stem cells so that I can do two transplants. In fact, two and a half. So hopefully if this one doesn't work, we'll try again and, and again, uh, We'll keep on trying. We're not going to give up that easy. It's, it's a battering that your body is taking. I know you sent me some photos. I've been following everything you do. It's a, it's a really, really uncompromising journey. And yet there's still a smile on your face. Your spirits are still high. How do you keep in that frame of mind? I think, I think it's, it's something that you have to have in, all, in your life. I mean, there's no use crying about it or being upset about it. You just go on with life and rather be smiling than be sad. I mean, I'd rather be smiling than be upset and, and, and pushing my body to the limits all the time, all my life. And, and I'm finding it fairly easy. Um, obviously, I'm trying to keep healthy every day. The strength that you draw from your wins, are there, are there particular races where you really had to dig deep to get across the finish line that perhaps remind you of just how strong and resilient you can be when you need to be? Yeah, I mean, it's funny that, that one of my hardest races was actually my 12th win uh, at 49 where I was pushed to the limit. When I finished that race, uh, I basically couldn't breathe. I was hyperventilating. So that's how far you push yourself over three and a half hours till your death. I mean, and... And Malacca happens to be one of those races, even though I've done these 240-kilometer races, they haven't been as tough 
at the Monaco because, as I say, the most important thing in life is the opposition. So if you're winning by a mile, it's not very difficult, you know. So, but if you're winning by a few seconds over three and a half hours, you push your body beyond. I mean, again, in that race, the guy was 10 or 12 years younger than me, so he's and very much fitter than me. So it does help. It does help. I mean, again, and it sort of hinders you as well because if I if I didn't have a high pain threshold, I'm sure I would have realized, gee, there's something wrong with my back. I mean, just can't sleep at night. There's something wrong. And again, I just pushed through and raced uh, the day before I got diagnosed with a big tumor in my spine. It's an extraordinary story. It's one I know is not done yet, Oscar, because you are every ounce a fighter. You've shown that in the kayak, and you're now showing it with this particular battle, which you will win. You will come through. I, I'm sure of that. And so I'm extending the invitation. Once you're through hospital, once you're back on your feet, once you're feeling strong enough, well, I'll have you up in Johannesburg, have you in studio, and celebrate some more of this terrific career of yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Dan. Really appreciate being on your show and, and uh, keep it up with us. I mean, people love this uh, banter and they love seeing people on, on air while we can't do anything. We can't watch any other sports. We might as well watch you and I doing something. There we go. Oscar Chilopsky, do yourself a favour. Jump online, do some Googling, have a look at the record. We've barely touched on what he's done over this extraordinary career from that first win at 20 in the Molokai, winning one at 49, winning races at 55. He's an inspiration. And do keep him in your thoughts. By the time you watch this, he will be in hospital. He'll be starting the next leg of his journey. We will keep you posted. But Oscar, good luck. We're thinking of you. We know you'll keep strong. And we look forward to seeing Oscar Chilovsky in studio on the Dan Nichol Show soon. And wrapping up the Dan Nichol Show this week, wrapping up the Dan Nichol Show in lockdown before we head back to studio next week is a very good friend of mine uh, who I have a slightly embarrassing uh, introductory story to because the first time I met him was at the Alfred Dunhill Links Championship. Uh, he was this diminutive, goatee, tattooed gentleman. And I, I slightly misheard the introduction and I thought he was from LinkedIn. And I spent the next 10 minutes telling him how valuable I thought his platform was and how great it was for promoting CVs. And he was doing a really good job. And he's a very polite guy and he just sort of nodded uh, nodded at me and smiled and inside thinking this guy is a proper idiot he probably still thinks that but uh, at least now i know he's no longer the boss of linkedin he's actually the creative genius and bass guitarist behind lincoln park hello Dave farrell hello dan yes i remember that story or that event very well happy to see that you've come full circle now and you and you completely understand the band these days I've been listening to your music relentlessly over the last few weeks, and it's That's, it's not as bad as everyone says. It's what I was, what I've always heard from your friends and family. Dan's, you know, great, great husband, great father, awesome taste in wine. Music yeah, tastes a little bit suspect, but now you're coming, you're coming around. We love it. Yeah, you're fitting in nicely with my collection of the Jonas Brothers and you kids on the blocks. <laughs> Loving this sound. Uh, and, uh, I'm happy. And look, good company. I'm happy to share. Uh, happy to share the stage with any of those guys. Uh, like it's, it's lovely to have you on the show. It was lovely to to catch up in, in very very strange times. What has been life like for Team Farrell over the last couple of months? It, you know, it's been a a weird time. I think we've simultaneously had some great things happen. Uh, just be, getting to spend more time with the kiddos and uh, slow down a little bit and obviously I had a lot of sacrifices as well that have gone with that. Um, but I have, I have been able to learn how to put together a good zoom outfit from the bottom up. You, you, you pull it off superbly. It's a great outfit for zoom. It's also the outfit I'd imagine you've been using as Dave Farrell schoolmaster, because you will also, I'm sure have been dealing with the challenge that is homeschooling children. Yeah, we've got three, uh, I used to say young, but now, they're not that young, 13, 11, and eight-year-old daughters at home. So there's been a lot of homeschooling happening, um, much, to, uh, much to the challenge of both myself and my wife. We've, we've figured out that we are probably not the best of educators. However, my, uh, my wife, Lindsay, did at one point, uh, she got her teaching degree, and she was a junior high teacher. So she's got that advantage going for her. But when it's when you're teaching your actual kids instead of students, I think there's a very large gap in uh, in how easy or difficult that might be. So 
I think like everybody, we've been uh, artfully struggling through that that sequence, but we just started, we just got on summer break uh, two days ago. So as of right now, we can have the kids sleep in and wear their jammies all day and feel like they're doing what they're supposed to and, and have us not feel guilt, guilty about it. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're striking a chord with parents all over the world at the moment. It's It's been one of the challenges. Corona has been an enormous challenge. But added to that, just the last 10 days or so, uh, another really big challenge in America, we're seeing a lot of here in South Africa, uh, the, the politics, the debate, the issues around race. From our perspective here, uh, this seems to have really energized America, and it seems as though there's a, a lot of discussion and a lot of much-needed change that, that, that is hopefully on the horizon. It's been a tough start to 2020 in the U.S., uh, like you said, COVID first, and then now with where we're at uh, in our discussions with race in the U.S., there's, there's a lot of pain. There's a long history of, of you know, inequality, racial inequality, injustice. Um, that's kind of deep in our roots. And so conversations are happening about that more so than I've ever seen um, across all sectors, you know, across all groups of people. I think that that's awesome and, and super important. I'm, I'm just hoping that, you know, I, I grew up in Southern California during the LA riots. And I remember, you know, when I was maybe 12 or 13 years old at that point, thinking I had a, I had a conscious thought, like our generation is going to do better. With this, like our generation is going to let uh, really affect change in the U.S. And now, you know, fast forward 30 years, I've, I've kind of been disheartened, thinking, looking at it, and saying, like, I feel like I've seen this before, and I feel like not as much change as I as I as I hoped would have by now. Um, so I'm 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 hopeful, at least at this point, that moving forward from here, we'll actually see some some real progress. It's a space we watch from South Africa with uh, with all too much familiarity, I'm afraid. We still have a, many of those challenges to deal with here as well. And here's to, to both of our countries taking steps forward in the right direction, which is long overdue. Change needed there. Change also coming in in what you do for a living. Can you see on the horizon Lincoln Park playing 60, 70,000 people crammed into a stadium, given the, the way the, uh, the world of social distancing has now come upon us? I think we're on a path to getting, you know, getting back to that space where, where shows, you know, music can happen in a live setting where people can come together in a crowd, watch sports, watch music, you know, watch entertainment in general, movie theaters, go out to dinner and sit next to each other, all that bit. I think we're on a path to getting closer to that. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful and excited for that. I know with Lincoln Park, we've been on hiatus now for, for, a good chunk of time, maybe a few years, but I also believe I can't give you a timeline. Our fans are going to jump all over it if I say anything right now about when we'll play again. But I do think we'll we will play again. I I want I know we want to write uh, and release new music, and I know we want to play shows. Uh, we just don't know when the timing is going to be right for that. My only request will be that once the flying starts, once the music gets going, once the band is up and running, that you include South Africa on that list. You've got a, an army of fans here. South Africa loves Lincoln Park. Uh, I know you've been here before. I know you're a big fan of South Africa. Uh, so when it happens, we certainly won't hold you to a date, but when it happens, new music and so plus all of the old favorites, which I'm getting more familiar with by the day, please make sure you've got South Africa on that touring list. South Africa 2030 is uh, it's on the radar. <laughs> no, I, like, you, like you said, though, South Africa for me is is one of my favorite places we've we've gotten a visit. Um, in addition to touring there, we've we've vacationed there, we've gotten to do safari there. I love to surf, I love to play golf. So those two things obviously are great there. Um, food is excellent. People are great. You guys do have some some wonderful music, Dan. I'm sure you're not very tuned into it, but. South Africa does have some awesome music. You should check that out too. Uh, all, all great things though. <laughs> and so on a wonderfully positive note for South Africa, endorsement from the great Dave Farrell. We bid you farewell from the Dan Nichols Show in lockdown with Brightrock. Next week, we are back in studio 
back recording and back with our full hour-long show on Supersport. A big thank you to our other guests this week, Wade Van Eekirk, Olympic gold medalist, world record holder in the 400-meter hurdles, and Oscar Chalupski, one of the all-time great paddlers fighting that battle with cancer. We wish him the very best of luck and hope that he's back on his feet and annoying us again as he does so well as soon as possible. And of course, my good friend Dave Farrell, who will be in South Africa very soon, playing to sold-out crowds across the country. Dan Nichols Show with Brad Rock in lockdown. Been an absolute pleasure. Huge thank you to Stefan Robbie Productions, who've made so much of it happen. Next week, we'll see you on Supersport, in studio, back for the full hour-long show with a very special group of guests, including World Cup-winning Springbok captain John Smith and comedian Donovan Goliath, who has owned social media during lockdown. See you next week for The Dan Nichols Show. Good night. Life, like the conversation, keeps changing. Get the first ever needs-matched life insurance that changes as your life changes.